Good evening, everyone. Chip Cooper for FTC Guardian and my partner, Alan Cutts. Here we are for the first hangout of the month of June 2019. And within about three weeks or so, two and a half weeks, we'll be halfway through the month, through the year 2019. It's hard to imagine how fast it's going. So before I ask Alan what he's been up to, uh, I'll just give you a quick report. Uh, we've been spending time uh, traveling and visiting friends and both sets of children and grandchildren have come in. <laughs> we had such a wonderful time with them, but it's nice that they've gone home. We needed an extra day or two of rest after all that was done. It was great fun. We had a great time, ate a lot of seafood, you know, all that good stuff. Um, so what are you doing, Alan, or what have you been doing? Uh, you know, we've been busy. We've got a couple of kids staying with us right now from uh, 19 and our a 19 year old boy and his uh, 17 year old sister is 17. Year, he's a, both of them are professional cyclists. The 17 year old girl uh, is being, a, she, she, she's trying to make the Olympic team. She's, I mean, in fact, she would be, she will be on the Olympic team if the, uh, the people will give her enough points to get in it because she's, uh, she'll be a junior and the U.S. is trying to get her to get in as a junior. They don't normally let somebody in as a junior. Uh, but she's like Bicycling Magazine and Bella News, all the people who cover cycling call her a teenage phenom because she's super, super good. So she's staying with us for uh, uh, for a while. Excellent. So I'm not drinking beer. I'm drinking sparkling water. Just so yeah. you'll know. <laughs> so I guess we're ready now. So well, I'm hang on a second. It says, uh, ever, is everybody's live stream offline? No audio here. Let me just ask the question and somebody mark it. Can you guys see us and hear us? Somebody somebody post in there if you can see me. Uh, Norm, can you see me and hear me? Because I can see you and hear Chip. Yes. Now oh, there's a connection problem. On our side, everything's working. Yeah. And I've turned off everything here. I've got another computer. Yeah, it's now. on a... Uh, I've turned it off. Um, so. Yes, but okay, Norm says, yes, when you click the YouTube, uh, reconnect doesn't do anything. It's working on our side. The, um, the replay video should be working. Well, there go, some of them are going, are going, you know, you can go to straight to YouTube. And uh, they say when they go to YouTube, it's not working either. All right. Well, let's go ahead and I told them what we're going to go ahead and go through. And then hopefully it's recording. And when you're done, you'll have to see if, it's, if it recorded or not. If not, we'll have to do another one just as a recording. So we have something to put in the recording. Okay. All right. So we want to uh, share my screen. Yep. Right. That's yep. the next. And that's the one I want to share right there. Hopefully you can see that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So let me let me get my clicker on here. Okay. So you see, wait a minute. Okay. Okay. So you see the title slide there, FTC nails Earthbox, U-R-T-H-V-O-X, for deceptive reviews and free trial offers. So it's a very, this case has been reported on in all sorts of journals that I subscribe to. Uh, and everybody seemed to think that it was a big deal. It's very current, so that's why I chose it for this presentation for our members. And here you see what Earthbox really is all about. They are selling boxes of snacks that are supposed to be good for you, which to me is hard to understand how they could be. I mean, you know, if they're carrots and, and <laughs> veggies and things like that, that I know are pretty good for you. I don't know that they could get them in a box and keep them fresh, but these are munchies that are supposed to be good for you, snack boxes that they sell. And so here's a little bit about how they're going about doing what they do. They're a California-based company, uh, and they make offers 
and sell direct to consumer snack delivery. So they'll, they'll deliver it to your house or to your office. Now in blue text there, you'll see a, a quick summary of what they were doing or some of what they were doing with respect to their marketing. Number one, they had incentivized consumer and customer reviews, meaning that there was a reward given for a favorable review. And of course, we'll see what the FTC has to say about that in just a minute. And they also had free offers that converted to a continuity program, a very high risk situation, which you probably already realize if you've been a member for a while and have attended any of these hangouts that we do. So what did the FTC have to say about, in, in very quick summary form, have to say about these two marketing approaches? Number one, the incentive reviews were deceptive, according to the FTC. And number two, this um, continuity program uh, involved the failure to disclose key terms regarding the free trial as it converted into the continuity program. And of course, you see in parentheses there, ROSCA, which is the acronym for a federal statute that governs continuity programs. And the result, of course, is in red. This, of course, is a summary of what happened. We'll get involved in more detail in just a minute, but it's a 2019 case decision. Uh, the FTC filed the complaint and settled with Earthbox and the CEO personally, I'm not sure I can pronounce his name correctly, Ben Baruzzi possibly, uh, for $100,000 jointly and severally. So this is one of those cases where not only was the business entity um, fined, but also the entity was pierced and the individual and personal assets were on the line for the jointly and severally for the $100,000 fine. Now let's get involved here for just for a minute about these reviews. Obviously, Earthbox wanted a lot of reviews and the reviews and the, the marketing strategy that they used was very successful. You can see here that in 2017 alone, they had 695, almost 700 reviews. And out of that 700, approximately 612 were positive. And the vast majority of those positive reviews came from their incentive program. Only 68 were negative and 15 were neutral. So obviously the incentivized program worked. The question is, is it legal? And the FTC says no, that they were deceptive and here's specifically what happened. There was sort of two phases of the incentive program in white text there you see, they were providing, Earthbox was providing a store credit for consumers who would post reviews either on a product review site or a social media site. Then later, after it was clear that they were working, the incentive program was working, then they expanded it to offer free snack boxes uh, delivered if customer, instead of a store credit, uh, if a customer would post positive reviews. So that's what happened. That's what was going on with respect to their uh, incentivized program. The FTC said in yellow there that there was no disclosure of the incentive for the positive reviews. And you remember, this is an, an endorsement according to the FTC. And if there is payment or some type of material benefit that is being given in exchange for the review or the endorsement, then the FTC says there needs to be a disclosure of this material connection. And that was not provided either by Earthbox or their customers. Uh, and we'll see in a little bit, in just a few minutes, also the FTC said and claimed that Earthbox had no internal method of monitoring reviewers. Well, this is a little crazy and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and then you see this quote at the bottom by the Federal Trade Commission, which is the rationale for the, room, the rule, uh, which is people should be able to trust, people being consumers, be able to trust that good customer reviews aren't the result of companies secretly paying for the reviewers. So that's what the FTC had to say about the reviews. And then we get to the deceptive free trial offer that converted to a continuity program. And if you are not sure about what a continuity program is, 
It's what most online marketers would like to have, meaning that customers are agreeing to pay usually on a monthly basis, $30, $40, whatever, monthly until the customer decides to opt out or cancel. So it can go on indefinitely until the customer cancels. This is the type of income stream that most online marketers are looking for. And so the first two bullets here really are consistent with what most people have done in the past. You say that there's a free offer of something, and it could be a free, um, a free um, uh, book or, or something like that, free ticket to a webinar, whatever, but it has to be something that is shipped because for shipping, there has to be payment, right? And so the vendor, Earthbox in this case, requires shipping, but the snack box is free. The result though is that Earthbox gets the credit card information for the shipping and handling costs. That's the key to it. And then what happens usually, but not in this case, usually at the end of this freebie period, then there is an, an upgrade automatically to the say 30 or 40, $50 a month for a membership or some kind of subscription. But here, Earthbox was extremely aggressive because as you see in the last three bullets here, the free snack box was given, but then there was an automatic enrollment at the time of a six month subscription, which required the customer to prepay for the entire six months up front, which in round numbers was approximately $300. And then in order to get out of the continuity program, they had to cancel. Uh, and so this was a very aggressive program, much more aggressive than anything I've seen. And of course it caught the FTC's attention. Now there's this federal statute I mentioned earlier. Most of you probably have heard of it, ROSCA, um, and it deals with continuity programs. And there are three basic requirements. You can see with the bullets there, there needs to be a disclosure of the material terms and the timing of it or placement of it on the checkout page is before getting the billing information or the credit card information in almost every case. Number two, the customer has to give consent before the credit card is charged. So you've got two timing issues here disclosure before getting billing information, consent before charging the card, and then a simple mechanism for opting out. Um, and here, again, there was no clear and conspicuous disclosure of material terms, and they failed to get the express consent before charging the card, as the uh, FTC alleged. And this is the continuity notice. This is the notice that was supposed to be, or that was given, that really didn't qualify. And here it is, Earthbox is a members only snack club that delivers new products every month. After your free trial, you'll get six months of regular monthly deliveries for just $14.99 per month prepaid. Please enjoy your free Earthbox on us. Now, if you're a consumer or are wearing your consumer hat and you're reading this notice, you just aren't quite sure if you're being charged six months in advance, again, approximately 300 bucks, because it sounds a little bit like you're going to be charged that much every month, $14.99. So it's really sort of defective on its face. And this is the way the notice was presented. You see here the order summary, and the order showed $2.99, right? But then, then, excuse me, then below there is this is this notice I just read, and of course it's defective. So uh, you can see that uh, that this just didn't 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 fly with respect to the federal statute known as ROSCA. Now also you know that for about a year and a half I believe it is California has had its own similar statute to ROSCA known as the California Auto Renew Law again, dealing with continuity programs. Now it's important to understand that this California auto renew law is more comprehensive than ROSCA. And you can search in the member area here for FTC Guardian, California auto renew law, you see it in red there. 
and you can find at least one, and I believe possibly two prior hangouts that we've had. And one strategy would be to make sure that you comply with the California auto renew law. And because it is more comprehensive than ROSCA, you really don't even need to think about ROSCA because the requirements for ROSCA are a subset of the requirements for the California auto renew law. So if you simply focus on the California statute, make sure that you're compliant. And of course, we've got a, a hangout that will help you do that. You're gonna be in good shape. So the final order here, you can see the bullets at the top, $100,000 fine, both to the company and to the CEO individually, jointly and severally. And there was a long list of compliance reporting requirements, which uh, went on for, I believe, 10 years. And it's sort of like getting audited by the Internal Revenue Service for 10 years, really, really difficult. But you can see in the bullets below in this, in this slide, if you use incentivized reviews in the future and provide the notice, then you need to follow these rules, right? And I'm really not even going to go through the rules because you see the arrow, the yellow arrow and the, the little uh, notifier up there that it's not feasible. I mean, if, if you had an incentivized review program and provide the notice that these people got freebies, and then you have these additional requirements of having a system to monitor them uh, and all sorts of reporting, it's just not feasible to do it. Because in the first case, if you provide the notice that these people were compensated for their reviews, most consumers are not gonna take the review very seriously. And then on top of all of that, you've got these additional requirements by the Federal Trade Commission that really make it not feasible if you really follow the rule of the, uh, the providing the, uh, the disclosure of the, um, the, the, the relationship with the other company. So that's, that's what we have there. And then the two big takeaways from this case, positive reviews are really good. I say gold here, but you can't incentivize the positive review with onerous disclosures and related requirements. That's what we, what we just talked about. I mean, if you have to give the disclosure, it sort of kills the value of the, uh, of the review to most consumers, probably not only most, but all. And then number two, continuity billing plans are highly regulated by the federal ROSCA statute and other states. There's some other states that have similar statutes. And of course, uh, the federal statute is ROSCA and the California Auto Renew is the most comprehensive. And I will say this also as a takeaway, um, the Federal Trade Commission really, really uh, monitors anyone who is uh, offering a, a continuity billing plan situation, particularly if there is a free offer that, that converts into the, the, um, the billing plan, the continuity plan. If you have, in fact, I would highly recommend that you don't use and don't use the strategy of having a free offer that then converts to or transitions into a, um, a, a, a billing plan and an auto renew plan, because it's going to be fly spec by the Federal Trade Commission. And if you're not in strict compliance, you're going to be in trouble. All right, the tags that I'm going to add to this video are auto renew law, California auto renew law, ROSCA, continuity billing plan, negative option plan, which is another name for continuity uh, plan, and also recurring income plan and subscription agreement. So now I'm back um, and Alan's here and I'm, I'm going to answer questions, but we've already had one question submitted to Alan, I believe, earlier that I'm going to handle here very briefly. Do you think that that's a good way to start, Alan? Yeah, because, you know, again, I don't think anybody can hear. I just, we just had somebody check in, Stella, and I just asked, texted Stella here to say if she could hear us and see us. Uh, I put a notice to everybody to read this that it doesn't look like you, I think it must be YouTube Live isn't working. Um, but Stella hasn't responded yet that she can see us or hear us. Um, All right. So let me go ahead and, and give uh, a, a general response. I'm not going to get very specific 
into this this person's uh, business because we don't practice law here on uh, FTC Garden, but we provide general information and training. And so I'm going to look at these questions and provide general information for you. And this particular member is located in France, not in the United States. And he says that he and his wife are selling information products, which is typical for, you know, a so-called information marketer. And they involve horse training, like the animal, a horse in the form of videos, mostly video courses involving horse training. So that's really what the business is all about. And here's one question uh, involving the terms of use, which if you guys have been through our program, you've had to answer some questions about the terms of use. And one of the misconceptions that this particular member has is this, that the terms of use somehow involves the sale of these info products, which is not true. There really needs to be two documents on your website if you're selling something, right? The number one document would be terms of use. And it's going to be uh, linked at the bottom of every page, typically right beside the link for your privacy policy, right? The thing to remember here though, and listen very carefully, is that the terms of use is not an enforceable contract. And the reason is no one is requiring anyone to click on an I agree button or a similar button indicating that they agree with it, right? And in the absence of that formal agreement, and so when you click on uh, the I agree button or similar button electronically, it's the same as signing a document. You're taking this overt action saying, I agree. And this in the online world is clicking to say you agree or check in a box typically. So that doesn't happen with the terms of use, but the terms of use are important and are typically targeted to just anyone who stumbles onto your website and looks around, but doesn't buy anything yet. Right. And it has notices about um, disclaimers of warranties. We don't make warranties. Some other things, maybe there is a DMCA notice as well about copyright infringement and some other legal notices that have some kind of effect as a notice if somebody clicks and just bothers to read them, but it's not an enforceable agreement. So if you're selling something the way this member is, essentially horse training in the form of streamed videos, I'm guessing, then you need a second document that deals with customers. And that document needs to be a contract, a binding contract that will basically help you rest assured that you're going to get paid and continue to get paid. And then secondly, help to limit your liability exposure. That's the purpose of it, basically. There are others. So the one document that typically applies to the vast majority of our members, and I'm going to read it, it's, it's a long name. In fact, it's the longest name of all the documents that are in our system. And here it is, SAS hyphen account hyphen membership agreement, click wrapped print. So what, what is meant by all of those terms is that depending on how you answer questions, you can create a, a document that allows a customer to set up an account to come back and buy things, or it can be a software as a service or a subscription agreement, right? Or a membership agreement, depending on how you answer the questions, it'll gin up any of these types of documents. And this one, is intended to be a binding agreement and it's going to be presented uh, typically in a scroll box or the new approach. And we had a, a hangout about this about a year ago, I believe the, the check box, you know, I agree with the terms and conditions, which is a link, or I agree to the subscription agreement, or I agree to the membership agreement and the box, the check box is unchecked. So you cannot proceed uh, with the completion of the checkout unless that box is checked. That's the new approach. And there's a lot of information about that in another hangout or so. So that's what you need. You need both terms of use and this, this, this uh, subscription agreement possibly for the material that you're selling. Now there's another question and Alan and I were kicking this around before <laughs> we went live here about how you handle the portion of the, terms of use and also the, the customer agreement, given the fact that you're located in France, 
But as you say in this, this information here, just about everybody, if not everybody, in terms of your customers are in the United States. So uh, for those of you who've gone through this process, you remember probably ask, you know, what's, what state law applies? Well, typically it's the state you live in, right? It's a no brainer for people who live in the United States pretty much. But for someone who lives outside of the US, you know, the big question is, what do we do? And I think, well, obviously there are two choices. Uh, and Alan can can pipe in as, just as soon as I get through here. I can see him chomping at the bit. But one is to say France, right? And to put in uh, the, the local court, the names of the local courts. Uh, the Republic of France is the, com the country, uh, the name of your local court, that sort of thing. Right, both in the arbitration and in the choice of law uh, sections of the agreement. The problem with that is that some of your customers who are located, all of whom are located in the U.S., but some of them may be turned off by the fact that the French law applies. Right. I'm suggesting, though, that not many people read the fine print here. So maybe in Alan's. <laughs> yeah. So it may be that to stick with French law may be the way to go. The other approach is to pick a state. And my clients over the years have this conception, and I'm not sure that it's true and correct, but they believe that Europeans, for example, think that the state of New York is a much more cosmopolitan state and is much more conducive to international business than just some other state, maybe Florida, for example, or Georgia, whatever. So you could pick, uh, you could pick, pick uh, New York and put the related information in there, but be sure that you're going to be relying on an arbitration clause, which can be handled electronically. Uh, it can be handled by uh, video conferencing, and you need to make sure that that phrase is in the arbitration provision. You know, it can be handled directly or by video conference. So those are the two options, and I'm not sure whether there is a right or wrong of the option of the of those two. And I think after we, after I'm sort of thinking as I'm speaking here, and Alan and I chatted about it briefly right before we went live. I'm sort of opting for choosing France, so I don't think it's going to matter that much. But we'll see what we'll see what Alan says. There's one more question, and that question was. And again, most of you who've been through this process have been asked the question, do you need a special disclaimer? Now, the both the, the um, terms of use and this customer agreement has a general disclaimer of warranty. We don't make any warranties express or implied, including the implied warranties of merchantability and fitness for a purpose. That's fairly standard boilerplate language. That's in both of these two documents. You don't even have to answer a question. It's just in there. Right. But then the question is, do you need something in addition to that that's more specific? Right. And we call that a special disclaimer. And this person says, what about something like horse activities? Now, Alan's from Texas. He knows a lot, a lot more about horse activities than I do. I think I rode one as a young kid. Uh, horse activities can be dangerous. That's true. We're not liable for any damage to you or your horse for improper use of these techniques. Wear proper protective equipment like a riding helmet, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think that is a very good start right there for a special disclaimer. It's very straightforward to the point. You might elaborate it a little bit. One way you can go about doing some research is to maybe look for other types of disclaimers that are sort of similar uh, involving, you know, types of outdoor, outdoor activities, mountain climbing, you know, all these things, and then borrow some of that language and sort of work it into this sentence that you've created. And I think you're going to be in excellent shape. So those are my answers and responses to the questions. And uh, I'll let Alan fire away with what he recommends. Yeah, I would, I would stick with France just because I don't think anybody really cares that much about it. Not that many people are going to really read it. If you think you want to use New York, use New York. <clears throat> I would definitely go into the disclaimer part and just add more text about the riding helmet and all that kind of stuff just to kind of the, the cover your butt claws. I mean, it's not going to hurt anything. I mean, you have to think about it. Not that many people actually read it. And if they do, it's there. So you, you need to do your job 
to put all the information there that you need for that one or two or three people who are going to read it and to be legal. But the majority of the people just aren't going to read it. If, if you have a good product, they like what you sell, they know you like you, trust you, and they're going to buy from you once or twice, then, you know, all, all is going to be good. It's just for the, it's, again, it's just like insurance. It's, it's insurance from a, a liability standpoint, from FTC that you've got your butt covered from a FTC compliance standpoint, and you've got yourself covered if somebody stumbles on it and wants to refund or doesn't agree with your terms or whatever you've got. Well, I've got it right here in my terms of use. Here it is, you know. So it's just, yeah. it's all cover your butt stuff. And I, I just want to reiterate that FTC Guardian from the beginning has always been a training and document company. We provide training and document. It's a DYI service where we provide you with the training and the documents. Chip is an attorney, but he is not a practicing attorney for FTC Guardian. He can't do that. So you can hire Chip outside of FTC Guardian, but within FTC Guardian, all we can provide is is training and documents for you because we're not a legal entity for that. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not a law firm. So right. So another thing I was thinking about while Adam was talking, uh, you know, we've got where I live on Amelia Island, Florida, down on the south end. There's a stable where you can go. I don't know. Rent a horse is the right term, Alan. I don't know. You don't rent one, whatever. <laughs> but you can pay a fee and hop on a horse and ride him down the beach. And, and I'm sure there are any number of these stables around the country where you can do that in the mountains. I know in the western part of North Carolina, where I visited many years ago, they had these places. And go look online and see what they're saying about safety, right? Helmet, all these things, uh, the right kind of boots or shoes, that would be important. All of those things. And borrow some of those phrases and work them into the language that you already have here and you'll be in excellent shape. Okay. All right. All right. So that's it. Uh, hopefully this all recorded and hopefully you find out shortly. So we know whether we've got to do this again or, uh, yeah. or not. Yeah, We can do it again if we have to hope we don't, but uh, yeah, we can do it again. That's it, Alan. That's all we have, right? That's all I have. Okay. That's all I have. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.